very, very good. <laughs> good morning, everybody. I said at the start of 2014 that I wanted to cause a political earthquake in Great Britain. And I think if you look at last year, we didn't do a bad job, did we, really? We managed to win the European elections, uh, and we then had uh, a couple of remarkable events in the late summer and early autumn of last year, uh, where two members of Parliament, uh, Douglas Carswell and Mark Reckless, didn't just defect, didn't just cross the floor to UKIP, uh, but did something I don't think I've seen in politics in my lifetime. They, as a matter of honour and principle, recognising that it's the voters, it's the people that actually are the bosses, resigned their seats and put themselves up for by-elections. And I, I have to say, I think in doing that, I think in doing that, both of these gentlemen showed uh, that actually UKIP is a party that wants to put the trust, the faith, and the honesty and integrity back into British politics. And I'm very pleased they both won their seats in the by-elections. I really am. But we, towards the end, um, towards the end of that period of time, uh, we saw, uh, particularly in the case of the Reckless campaign in Rochester, uh, we saw the way the political establishment in Britain behaves and reacts if it feels threatened. Uh, the campaign that was fought against Mark uh, was negative, uh, very personal, and deeply unpleasant. And I think what it did was to set the tone uh, for what is going to be politics from the big parties in the first half of 2015. Uh, in the first ever fixed-term parliament, on the 2nd of January, the first business day of the year, the two big parties came out and began the general election campaign and started to fire their artillery shells at each other. Uh, we're six weeks in uh, to all of this. Uh, I don't know about you, but I feel uh, that it is endlessly negative, incredibly boring, uh, and I think that people are beginning not to listen. They're talking to themselves. They're talking to each other in Westminster. Um, and <laughs> there is a country beyond Westminster. There's a country of real people out there. Um, and in many ways, uh, they're crying out. They're crying out for a different kind of politics. They're crying out for different people in politics. They're crying out to be represented by people who look and sound like them. Um, and that's why... Uh, my first speech of this year, my first public speech of this year, uh, is here in Castle Point. Now, our, our candidate here, Jamie Huntman, who spoke earlier, uh, Jamie I met a couple of years ago and recruited uh, into UKIP. He'd never been involved in politics before. Uh, Jamie's an Essex boy. He's a local businessman. He runs a timber merchant. He's engaged uh, with local community activities. You know, people like Jamie aren't represented by almost anybody in Westminster today. And there are millions of people like him. So he's part of the UKIP People's Army. He's become an Essex County Councillor. Uh, he's now the bookies odds on favorite to win this seat of Castle Point. <laughs> oh, and I nearly forgot. He's unashamedly patriotic and proud to be British and doesn't mind saying so. And it's going to be a very different House of Commons after May the 7th. The people like Jamie Huntman are there on those green benches and it'll be one that millions of people can connect with. And in some ways, uh, I would say to Jamie Huntman that the journey that he's been on is a very similar journey to the one that I myself went on. Because for me, it was in 1990. Uh, when I saw us joining the exchange rate mechanism and I saw a conservative government that pegged us effectively to the Deutschmark as a precursor to us joining what in the end became the Euro, I saw that supported by the Liberal Democrats and by the Labour Party and it seemed to me at that moment they didn't believe in Britain. They didn't believe we were good enough to run our own country. They didn't believe we were good enough to make our own laws. They didn't believe we were big enough and strong enough to make our own trade deals with whomsoever we chose around the world. They didn't even think we were good enough to keep our own currency. And if it hadn't been, if it hadn't been for those campaigns from out with the establishment in the 1990s, this country would have joined the euro 12 or 13 years ago. 
So I got involved in politics because I could see these people simply didn't believe. Now, uh, my journey has been a rather longer one than our local candidate, Jamie Huntman. And in fact, uh, having stood and been UKIP's first ever candidate and just managed to squeak past the late great screaming Lord Such in the Eastleigh <laughs> by-election, uh, I stood in a whole series of by-elections, general elections, European elections, and I did begin to wonder uh, whether possibly I might become the patron saint of lost causes. Uh, but I'm pleased to say uh, that over the course of the last few years, a lot of people have been on that same journey that I've been on and Jamie Huntman's been on. A lot of people have begun to understand uh, that actually out there in this country, outside of Westminster, the backbone of the British economy are the small men and the small women. They're the five million people who set up their own businesses, who act as sole traders. These are the people that create nearly 11 million jobs in the private sector. These are the people that pay their taxes. And actually, what has happened to them, and it doesn't matter anymore whether it's a Labour government or a Conservative government, what has happened to them is they've all become victims of the new system by which our economy works. We have a lethal combination of big government, big banks, and big business. It is known as corporatism. And we are now living in a corporate economy we're living in, a, in an economy, actually, where capitalism and free markets and enterprise and ambition have been replaced and are often crushed by a modern form of corporatism, which is supported by all three political parties, is supported by the trade union movement, and, of course, has as its HQ those big glass and steel buildings based in Brussels. And we are the only political party that is standing up for the small man. We're the only political party that genuinely believes we've got to redefine capitalism in a way that it can work for everybody. It is only through that wealth creation that we will generate sufficient taxes to have the kind of welfare state that all of us want to have in a decent country. And I can tell you that because that message is so powerful and is so positive, we now have a political establishment, a political class that are scared of us. They're very scared of us. They don't want lots of people like Jamie Huntman sitting on the green benches. <laughs> and they're going to do, they're going to do the, everything they can to knock us over the course of the next three months. I saw a bit of this in the European election campaign last year, where there seemed to be sort of endless negative campaign. My alternative CV was in the newspapers daily. Uh, let me say this. However beastly the establishment is to me or to any of our candidates in winnable seats, however personal and nasty this campaign becomes, UKIP will rise above it, we will turn the other cheek, we will ignore their insults, and we will get on saying to the British people, we believe in Britain and we want your vote because we want change. And perhaps one of the reasons why they're going to be nasty is they've understood that actually something quite remarkable has happened in British politics in the last three years. I can stand here and say that I am the leader now of the only truly national British political party. UKIP is the only political party with elected representation in the four corners of the United Kingdom. Think about the other parties. I mean, obviously, by definition, Plaid and the SNP are parties confined to their own areas, but look at the Labour Party. The Labour Party is now a regional party, effectively, of the north of England. Look at the Conservative Party. They effectively have become a regional party of the south of England. Look at how UKIP performs in by-elections, whether they're in Liberal Democrat strongholds like Eastleigh, whether they're in conservative strong, previous Conservative strongholds, and one thinks of Clacton and Rochester perhaps as being rather good examples of that or whether it's in the Labour heartlands of Greater Rochdale, in Haywood and Middleton, where John Bickley, our candidate, came within a whisker of causing a very dramatic upset in a Labour seat. The point is that we are a truly national political party. We're actually bringing people together uh, in the way that the other parties appear to be dividing them. 
And we've done something else that I think is quite remarkable. We have crossed the class barrier in British politics. That is a remarkable achievement for UKIP. And we pick up support from across every social spectrum. <coughs> and we're also beginning now to dig quite deep into some of the ethnic community vote in this country as well. Because people that have come to this country legally, that have made this country their home, that have integrated within our society, they want the UKIP agenda as much as anybody else. And what you'll see uh, during this general election campaign are lots of UKIP candidates from the ethnic minorities. It's something uh, that the commentariat in Westminster probably won't understand, but I think all of us in this room do. So there is something very, very positive that we've done. And I think we've also, we've also, we're beginning to break down some of the ludicrous assumptions about UKIP. Now, David Cameron, our Prime Minister, who is not known for saying terribly nice things about me, <laughs> did come up with a line in his conference speech that I thought was quite funny, uh, although perhaps not a very nice thought. He said, if you go to bed with Nigel Farage, you'll wake up with Ed Miliband. I mean, it's not pretty, is it? It's not pretty. Uh, but what he was, what he was saying, what he was saying, um, and, and, and many of the commentators have said over years, is, ah, yes, of course, the UKIP vote just comes from former Conservatives. And actually, nothing could be further from the truth. Just look at the Rochester by-election, where by a margin of two to one, those that voted for us had not voted Conservative in the previous general election. Just look at our performance in the by-elections that I mentioned earlier. We are picking up our support from across the board, but we're also doing something that the other parties simply can't do. Uh, Jamie Huntman, whose uh, speech introducing me, um, said that uh, perhaps I refresh the parts that other politicians cannot reach, which was very nice of him. Um, and uh, after a dry January. Um, <laughs> but the point is this, UKIP as a political party, our candidates and our activists are reaching voters that the other parties can't reach because we're bringing back into the political system, we're re-engaging people who had not voted for anybody for the last 20 years and we should be very proud, I think, as a party that we're doing that and that we're really connecting. <laughs> And far from us being a threat to the Conservatives, and far from this ludicrous argument that if you vote for us, you'll get Labour, actually what we saw, we saw it first in the by-election in Eastleigh, but we saw it absolutely perfectly in Haywood and Middleton, is actually the Conservatives splitting our vote in Haywood and Middleton meant the Labour Party won, and UKIP is now the challenger in virtually every single parliamentary seat from Birmingham up to Hadrian's Wall, and we are going to give Labour in the north of England a real run for their money. Of that I have no doubt at all. And when the political class talk about the cost of living crisis, well, I think we really understand the cost of living crisis. We know what open door immigration has done to the wages of average people in Britain. We want to end that downward compression on wages by having a responsible immigration policy. We know that through green taxes, many of which were put into place, of course, when Ed Miliband was the energy minister, we know that people are paying far too much to heat their houses. And we know that for the low paid, life has become tougher. So we'll get rid of those green taxes. And we'll campaign for there to be no tax on the minimum wage so that people out there not earning a lot of money are given an even break. We understand that cost of living crisis, but we also understand there's a cost of government crisis in this country. You know, what has government done? Just look at what government has done to our communities, ever more dividing them. Look at what government has done to our basic freedoms by beginning to eradicate them, by allowing British citizens to be extradited or deported, whether it's to parts of Europe or to parts of America. And just look at what government continues to do in terms of building big government and nanny state Britain. As if we're not big enough, I'm certainly big enough and ugly enough to make up my own mind how I want to live my own life. I don't need to be told by big 
government. No, we are going to be very positive, and not just positive about policy, but positive about attitude. You know, people who vote for UKIP don't do it just because of the policies that we stand for. They do it because they see us as being honest, straight-talking, looking and sounding like them, and prepared to take on the tough issues that everybody else has spent decades burying under the carpet. Voting UKIP is a state of mind. Voting UKIP is not a protest. It is a positive affirmation that we need different people in politics and different policies for this country. And what we've shown people, far from all this negative talk, oh, well, UKIP won't win any seats in Westminster. Do you remember that after the European elections? UKIP will get nowhere. What we showed in those last two by-elections, and we're going to show in several parts, many parts of the country on May the 7th, is that if you vote UKIP, you will get UKIP. <laughs> and yes, we do believe in Britain. We believe in a Britain that is independent and self-governing. We believe in a Britain that controls its borders properly and sensibly. We believe in a Britain that rather than having an open door to nearly half a billion people, introduces an ethical Australian point-style system so that we can decide who comes to live and work and settle in our country. And we believe in a Britain where no longer do just the top three or four percent get all the privileges and get richer and richer. We believe in a Britain of social mobility. We believe in a Britain where everybody gets an even break. We believe in a Britain where everybody, through their own abilities, can get on and succeed. We believe in a Britain that actually stands up for the values of fairness. We believe in a Britain that believes that everybody is innocent until they're proved guilty. We believe in a Britain that re-establishes itself across the world. And one of the first places we would start, once we're cleared of, of, of EU membership, is to re-engage ourselves fully and properly with the 2.2 billion people that live within the Commonwealth countries. We believe in a Britain We believe in a Britain not just for the sake of, of, of the country, we believe in a Britain because we believe in its people and we believe with different leadership and different politics the people of this country can do better. And yes, we will launch later on in this campaign, under Suzanne's chairmanship, we will launch a full manifesto for the things that we will fight for and the things that we will campaign for. We've already pointed out that we could put an extra £3 billion into the National Health Service without increasing the size of our annual deficit. Uh, we'll campaign for, for real change within the National Health Service, for the engagement of the public so that they can vote for the bosses of the hospitals. We'll campaign for cuts in middle management and bureaucracy, and we'll campaign to get rid of car parking charges for people going to visit their relatives in hospital. We'll campaign, we'll campaign for a complete rethink about tuition fees and university education. We'll campaign for there to be no tuition fees for people studying science, technology, engineering, or anything to do with the medical pr profession they will move on to afterwards. We have chronic skill shortages in these areas. We're having to import engineers. We're having to import nurses and doctors from all over the world. If we had the right education system and we got rid of tuition fees for those subjects, we wouldn't need to do that. And we'll campaign, and we'll campaign for a different kind of politics. We'll campaign for a change in the electoral voting system. The first-past-the-post system is now bankrupt. It doesn't work anymore. And we'll campaign to give the voters some power in the constituencies. This coalition promised they would introduce the right of recall. They have done no such thing. And we'll make sure that the people once again become the boss, and if they've got a bad MP, they'll have the ability to put them to a test of a by-election. We'll, we'll campaign against the European arrest warrant. We'll campaign for fair British justice. And we'll campaign for our ex-service men and women to actually get a better degree of recognition in this country 
for the sacrifices that they've made. They've been treated, I think, appallingly. And one very simple, very cheap thing we could do that would actually make a very large number of people happy, we will fight and campaign for the introduction of a National Service Medal so that anybody that has served in military uniform has got their own medal to wear. We'll campaign against divisive taxation. We'll campaign against the bedroom tax and against the mansion tax because, frankly, what they do is to further divide a country that already is not at ease with itself. We go into this election with the pundits predicting that perhaps UKIP will win two or three seats. I am not going to give you a precise number today, but let me say this to you. Every time since 2012 that I've made a prediction of how we would do in a by-election or the English County Council elections or indeed the European elections, uh, despite great hoots of derision, I've been right every time. And I think we're doing very much better, uh, particularly in our key seats around the country, than anybody amongst the media at the moment currently understands. We are going to get a good number of men and women elected as UKIP MPs. And the question, of course, that everybody wants to ask is, well, what will you do once you've got those MPs? Well, let's be clear. You know, our absolutely primary goal, our reason for being as a party, is we want this country to be independent from the European Union. We want a trade deal with Europe. We want friendship and cooperation with Europe, but not, not have the majority of our laws made by those institutions. It is absolutely impossible that UKIP in Westminster would help one or other of the parties if they did not have a credible program for a referendum, a proper, full, free and fair referendum conducted correctly and within the right timetable. It would seem that the Labour Party have now set themselves completely against that and that that position is not going to change. So if that position is not going to change, there are no circumstances in which we would help Labour uh, to have a majority in the House of Commons. Uh, if Mr Cameron is sincere in his desire to have a referendum, well, we would want to make sure that it was held on the right terms. But we will not do a deal with anybody unless the British people get that chance to have that vote. But can I say now very clearly uh, that we will not be going into coalition government with anybody. Uh, we're, not a party that, we're not a party that views this general election as being our one big shot. Uh, we're a party actually that views this general election as being the one that gets us good representation in Parliament ahead of, perhaps in 2020, doing something on a really massive scale. There will be no short-term sellouts, appealing though the ministerial car might be to some in life, but there will be no short-term sellouts, but we would, we would only consider doing something on the basis of confidence and supply. I am bullish, I am optimistic about this party, what it stands for and what its prospects are on May the 7th this year. And I would say to voters in this country, if you believe in Britain, if like us you're unashamedly patriotic, if like us you believe that a career political class have let us and let this country down very badly, then come with UKIP on this journey. Come with us and let's put back some honesty, some integrity and some real people back into British politics. Thank you very much. Thank you.